this land, what response is God seeking from his people? I find that I'm drawn to the passion narrative in Mark, and particularly in chapter 14. And there are three characters in Mark chapter 14 from which I want to draw lessons, lessons that will show us that we are defined by our actions. So first, today, Judas, who betrayed his master. The next week, the woman who anointed Jesus. And finally, on the third week, the young man who ran away when our Lord was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. So today, the man... Judas, who betrayed his master. Betrayal is a part of life. In fact, before the COVID crisis, many of us were very engaged watching what was happening on the Malaysian political scene. And even today, some of us are still wondering who betrayed whom. Today's reading brings us face to face with a painful betrayal. So I'm going to read now from parts of Mark chapter 14, and you can follow it on the screen. Mark chapter 14, the word of God. I'm reading from verse 1. It was now two days before the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. For they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar from the people. Verse 10. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. And he sought an opportunity to betray Jesus. Verse 17. We're now in the upper room where the Lord is gathered with his disciples for the Passover meal. Verse 17. When it was evening, Jesus came with the twelve. And as they were eating, reclining at table, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be sorrowful and to say to him one after another, Is it I? He said to them, it is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread into the dish with me. For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. What can we learn from this betrayal by Judas? First, betrayal, the act, is wrong. Judas was recruited by our Lord, discipled by him, sent out to preach and do wonders in his name, treated as one of the twelve, and in fact, entrusted with the money bag for the group. So why on earth did he betray the Lord? We long to know, but it's not so explicitly given to us. One relevant factor is that Judas was a thief. We know that from John chapter 12. So the love of money had something to do with it. Others posit that Possibly he's a misguided zealot and that he may have been disappointed with 
the way of the cross that Jesus had announced. We're not told explicitly, but I think it's significant that many of us actually want to know why. And it could be we want to know why because very often we think that by knowing the reasons for the wrong action, it reduces the guilt. It doesn't make the action so bad. But in truth, the motive of a sinful action, its rationale, its reasons, do not make it any less a sin. Betrayal is wrong. To betray someone that you belong to, that you give your allegiance to, that you apparently seem to agree with and share in his mission, and then to betray him, that is plainly wrong. So we do need to take ownership that our action, for all of us, we have actions that are wrong. When I'm helping to restore someone who has committed adultery, it's not uncommon that initially in the conversation, the person who's guilty of adultery gives reasons why the act was committed, reasons having to do with the spouse. And it's as if because of failings in the spouse or unkindness by the spouse, he or she had little solace and therefore was more liable. So you see, uh, we're all prone to excuse ourselves. But that doesn't help. Because in order to find freedom, we need to recognize that the act is wrong. We need to take ownership of what is wrong. In fact, God himself helps us to know we are on a wrong cause of action. So my Bible professor would say that in his life, uh, he would know that there would be signs that he's pursuing a wrong cause of action, a palpitation of the heart or, or cold sweat, for example. And Lent is a time for us to examine ourselves, uh, to recognize the wrong actions that we are guilty of and perhaps have excused ourselves for committing them. Lent is that kind of time for us to be honest before God and take ownership and then repent of the things that we have done. Things that we have done, well, publicly, if you like, but also privately, what the Bible says, things that men and women do in the dark. So first, the act is wrong. Secondly, your choices are important. Judas, and as it is recorded, is making a cold, calculated act when he goes to the chief priests. And the Bible tells us he goes to them in order to betray Jesus to them. That's pure treachery. When did he begin to hatch this treacherous cause? When did he give up on Jesus' way of the cross? When did money become more important to him? And mind you, all along, leading up to this act of treachery, he has been part of the group. One might say he's been going to church. He is superficially in the company of Jesus and with the other disciples. But something else is going on in his heart and his act of treachery. And our own actions of doing the wrong thing is the result of not dealing with temptations, with the path of darkness when it first rises in our hearts. So I want to also tell you a story about two brothers very early in creation and how one brother kept in his heart 
resentment, jealousy against his younger brother. The stories of Cain and Abel. And there is a bitterness growing in Cain's heart, and God sees it. And so God says to Cain in Genesis chapter 4, verses 6 to 7, God says, or the word of God records for us, the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you but you must rule over it. Did Cain heed the warning? Sadly not, because he proceeded to kill his brother in cold blood. When we allow temptations to take root in us, that's a choice, friends. And uh, God has ways to try and check us, to get us to stop going down a path of increasing darkness and to change track. So our choices along life's journey, they matter a lot. The same Bible professor I told you who said that when he's about to do something which is plainly wrong in God's eyes, uh, there's a palpitation of the heart, cold sweat, there are bodily symptoms. So he knows God is trying to warn him and to correct him. This same professor said, but if you choose not to heed, if you choose to operate in the realm of darkness, you create a gap which the devil loves to come in and exacerbate. So our choice opens the gap, and then the enemy, Satan, using, well, the weakness of our flesh and our lust, exacerbates it, and then we are engulfed. So in John's Gospel, where Judas is also beginning to act in a deceitful and treacherous way, the moment when Judas sets his treachery to action, it is described in this way. Satan entered into him. He went out immediately, that is to do what he had premeditated. And the Bible says, and it was night. That's in John, John's gospel. Judas hardened his heart. But not without our Lord appealing to him even one last time. Because in that setting, we are told that Jesus offered to Judas a piece of bread that our Lord had dipped in the bowl. It's a sign of honoring someone. It's a sign of affection. You're one of us. Receive this bread. But Judas had hardened his heart. And so, my friends, our choices are important. The choice you make affects whether you let in the light of God or go deeper into the realm of darkness. Judas chose the latter. And the darkness finally cheated and overwhelmed him. Because we learn from the scriptures, he had cut himself so far from the light, from the light of God, from truth, from honor. He had been cut off so much, gone so far into the realm of darkness, that when he regretted his action, but couldn't return the money to the conspirators, the Bible says he went and hung himself. So our choices matter. You and I can choose the path that leads to life or we can choose the path that leads to death. Judas's sustained choice to get rid of Jesus by treachery led to darkness 
and death. He was double-minded. He was hypocritical. He was cold towards the Lord of life who loved him. And so are we. If we are honest with ourselves, we too, our actions reveal that we also are double-minded, hypocritical, and lacking in that love and trust in the one who loves us. So what hope is there for us who also act wrongly and choose to give in to darkness? The book of James, one of the followers of Jesus, writes, let no one say when he is tempted that I'm being tempted by God. For each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. So the word of God makes us responsible for our choices. And our wrong choices lead to death. There is no hope for us apart from one glorious truth. God extends grace to every one of us. So my third and final point. The act is wrong. Our choices are important. But don't miss this. God's grace is reaching out to you. In our Anglican Holy Communion liturgy, when we consecrate the bread and the wine, we use these words. Jesus, who in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread and gave you, Heavenly Father, gave you thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. In the same night that he was betrayed, Jesus voluntarily poured out his life for us. He knew the worst that is in us, all of us, the treachery, the mocking, the denial, the pride, the fear, the abuse of power, the unresolved bitterness. He knows the worst about us, but the love of Jesus has no cause in us. That's why it's amazing. It's amazing grace. It's indescribable love. On the night or in the night that he was betrayed, he took bread because he was going to offer himself on the cross because of his indescribable love for us. He went to the cross to pay the penalty for our sin, our wrong actions, our foolish choices, and all that it incurs. He's dealt with it. The debt is settled. He died as the penalty for our sin. And then he rose again to break the power of sin over us. And so in Romans we read, and this contains the gospel for you and me at this time of Lent. So yes, Lent is a time of self-examination, of being broken before God. But let the brokenness bring us to the cross. Because in Romans 4 we read, Jesus died for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. In other words, the dead is settled. We can look God in the eye. We can receive his full embrace. We don't need to run and hide. He died for our sins and then he was raised to life for our justification. In other words, he's put you and me right with God forever. Forever in right and enduring and in eternal relationship with the Lord. So my friends, we are not doomed to death like Judas, but we are destined to live by trusting Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. You and I can receive God's grace despite our wrong actions and foolish choices. 
In the same night, Jesus was betrayed by Judas, and we might add, it was also the same night he was denied by Simon Peter. Simon Peter wept bitterly when the cock crowed twice. But Simon Peter, in his failure, he found the loving hand of Jesus reaching out. More than that, restoring us. So this Lent, as you consider the life of Judas who betrayed his own master, think of your own actions which are plainly wrong in God's eyes. Remember that your choices lead either to light or darkness. And most important of all, put your hope in the grace of God that is in Christ Jesus to be restored and to be renewed. In a sentence, the tragic story of Judas betraying his own master, what is it saying to us? I believe with all my heart, and I invite you to respond. The message of this real painful episode is that we need to get right with God and stay right before him. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, your truth is a shining light. As we have this quiet moment before you, let your truth draw us back to yourself. We acknowledge our sin. We lament our wretchedness. We have sinned against you in thought and word and deed. Forgive us, Lord. Take away our guilt. Help us to amend our lives. And help us to receive your forgiveness full and free through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me.
Isso. 